If you're a physics SL student and you chose to do option A, sight and wave phenomena, then uh, I'm going to show you those equations here. So these ones right here, first of all, the, the option involves doing stuff with sight, so they're about how we perceive color and how the eye works. And the rest of it is wave phenomena. And it turns out these equations right here, and in fact the rest of this uh, option, is identical to uh, what we see for topic four, well, sorry, topic 11. So higher level students have to do wave phenomena. And if you look at all these equations right here, those are identical to what you have to do for your option. So this right here is for the uh, option A, sight and wave phenomena. So taking a look at that option, uh, we can look at which of these equations does what. These first two right here, both of these right here are for Doppler effect. And what this means then is we have something moving with respect to something else. So we have a source that's emitting sound of a certain frequency. So maybe I'll write that down. So over here, so F equals the, um, let's say frequency of source. So here we have sound, let's say. That's a, that's a common thing, but it doesn't just have to be that. But it's commonly used as a sound, for example, and the frequency is in hertz, or one over seconds. So what happens then is you have this source, and the source, let's say, is moving. So if the source is moving, then we use this equation right here. Now V equals the speed of sound, and US is the speed of the source. So the speed of sound of course is in meters per second, so is the speed of the source. And that's how you deal with this. Oh, uh, last thing we're missing I guess is F primed, which is the observed frequency. The whole idea then is that if something is moving, so maybe if the source is moving, then the frequency of sound that is observed will be different. So this will be the observed frequency. This would be by the observer, obviously. And this is also measured in hertz. Now, when do you use a plus or a minus? I mean, you can remember it, but if you just use a little bit of logic, you can actually figure out which one should be which. The reason is that things that come towards you should have a higher frequency. And if it goes away from you, it should have a lower frequency. So just imagine then if you have a moving source, well, which value of us would make sense? Should we add something or subtract something? So you can use a little bit of logic to figure that out. Now in this case, uh, with a moving observer, very similar thing happens. So still f prime, still f, still v, is still a speed of sound, except for u0 here, or u o, that's just the speed of the observer. So that's all this is. So u with a little o here is just the speed of observer. And that's also measured in meters per second. So this Doppler effect helps you to know then, um, well, emitted frequency versus observed frequency. What will you get? It all depends on if the source is moving or if the observer is moving. Now this one right here, this is Doppler effect essentially, but for light. So uh, here, for example, we might have red shift. So or blue shift or something like that. So red shift or blue shift. So here we talk about, okay, well if a light, if something that's giving off a light is going away from you or towards you, then this also talks about the, well, the frequency of light this time that's emitted versus this will be the change in frequency. Where this is V, that's your speed of light, and C is the speed, uh, sorry, whoops, uh, V is the speed of your source, and C right here will be the speed of light. So you can use that equation for light stuff. Now we can separate this right here into two then, so we can say, okay, well we've just done the left side. Let's look at the right side. So this one right here has to do with uh, diffraction, and we'll say it's a single slit. So single slit diffraction. That's when we use this one. 
So what I mean by that is you've got some light that's passing through a very small little opening, for example. And what you do then is you look at what, uh, what will happen to that light. And let's say it was red light. Well then, if the light was red coming in, then you'd expect to see some sort of big dot here, and then you'll actually have diffraction, which means you'll have other smaller dots that are further away. Now these ones right here, what we can do is try to measure, or try to look at, um, when we have the first minimum. And the first minimum happens, so this right here is theta. If this angle right here is theta, it turns out the first minimum happens at theta equals lambda over b. So theta is an angle. What's really important though is it's measured in radians. So this is a unit that you should know from your math class. So this is radians. So it's not in degrees, it's done in radians. Lambda is just your wavelength. And that's measured in meters. And b that's the opening size. So that's the size of your slit. So in this case right here, it would be the size of this right here. So opening is what I'm trying to write here. So opening, that would be measured in meters. So in this case right here, this right here, this distance or the size of the opening, that will be B. Now we have something else as well. This right here, um, this is used for Rayleigh criteria. That's what this one here is used for. Okay, that's this one for Rayleigh criteria. And this one only works for a circular opening. It turns out again though, this will be just resolved. That's what's going on here. So here we're talking about if you can tell two objects apart, that's when they have an angle of this. So this time theta, theta is just your angle that you can resolve things. So again, theta is still in radians. So that's how we deal with these right here. So if we have a circular opening, whoops, I actually wasn't very consistent with my just resolved, was I? I should have uh, closed my quotation marks here. So just resolved, that's when we use this Rayleigh criteria. Now here, this one right here, this equation, that one helps for, well, it's actually called um, Malice's law. Malice's law. And that one has to do with polarizers. So what we do then is we have light that comes in, and let's see here now, um, this I0, that will be the uh, intensity of incoming light. So I0 equals incoming intensity. And I is going to be the transmitted, transmitted intensity. Seems my computer is going a little bit slow. There we go. So transmitted intensity, and theta is just the angle between the polarizers. So what you can do then is, I think we talked about this in the other videos that you can actually have two polarizers that are um, at an angle theta apart, or not apart, but um, a rotation difference of theta. So if the two polarizers are parallel to each other, that means that the light coming in, I0, uh, well, let's see now, if they're parallel to each other, that means we'll have a cos of zero. Cosine of zero is one. That means in theory then, the transmitted intensity will be the same as the incoming. In real life, it's not quite that good because you always have some light that's absorbed, but this is the best you could have in theory. But then what if we rotate one of the polarizers with respect to the other? If we rotate those two polarizers, um, this is often done in degrees though. So this right here is measured in degrees, this angle here. So whereas this angle was in radians and this one was in radians, that's the key thing about both of these. Both of these ones right here are done in radians. However, this one here is done in degrees. So if we have them, let's say, at 90 degrees to each other, well, cosine of 90 is zero. So that means that the transmitted intensity will be zero. So that's a way to essentially stop the light from coming through. If you have one that's vertically polarized, let's say, another polarizer that's horizontally polarized, 
then the angle between them would be 90 degrees and that means you'd have nothing through so this light would be well this this system would be opaque you couldn't see through it now we have this right here n equals tan phi and this one that's actually called Brewster's law Brewster's law now that one has to do with light coming in. So if this is the uh, N is the index of refraction. And then we have light coming in like this right here with some angle phi. Okay, so instead of a theta here, we actually use an angle phi here. So we have some circle with a line through it. Um, although it didn't really look very much like a phi here. I'll try to draw it again here. So we have some angle phi. There we go, that looks a little bit better. So if this here is my angle, then it turns out that we're going to have in Brewster's Law, and in this situation, if you remember from uh, your notes or from uh, what you've learned, that the light coming out will be uh, polarized. Um, so we can see here the reflected light right here will be polarized um, parallel to the surface if these two right here, the reflected and refracted rays are 90 degrees to each other and if n equals tan phi. So remember that n equals the index of refraction. That has no units. And phi equals the, well we could say the angle of incidence. That's the angle that the light's coming in at. Remember the angle is measured uh, with respect to the normal. So angle of incidence. That's how we deal with that. So this is everything you need from this option A, sight and wave phenomena.